about to get alive what here. Do you do without your assistant? Hey, everybody. We are here at the 48th Annual Nashville Film Festival. Uh, my name is Maury, and I'm here with my co-host, Ben, of the Ben and Maury Show, Hello. Nashville's late-night talk show. And we are sitting here with record producer Tony Brown. Tony, how are you doing? I'm doing really good. I thought that was hot as hell out here. Well, it is hot as hell, and I'm wearing a sport coat, and, and uh, what you're wearing looks a lot more comfortable. I thought about that when I was coming over here. I, I was going to wear a jacket, then I thought, no, I shouldn't do that. It's going to be hot as hell. So I made the best decision. Well, and you look you look very cool, too. I mean, a lot cooler than us. I think uh, Ben here has a, a list of your accomplishments. Tony, I have your list of accomplishments, rattle, rattle off. courtesy of your assistant. Uh, quick facts. Over 40 years in the music industry, over 100 million record album sales, over 100 number one singles. Where do you get off? Where do I get off? What you're sh you're showing off here? I know it. It's like I'm impressed about myself. <laughs> but you know, I, it was uh, I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, we call the golden years here in Nashville from '89 to '97, and uh, that's when records were actually selling. So I'm glad my career was then and not starting right now because streaming has just almost demolished the uh, record business. Well, that's uh, we were just talking talking with uh, Stacy. Um, and and talking about that film in the festival, the last songwriter, yes. and all about how uh, the, the, it's just not really a viable career anymore to be a songwriter due to streaming in the music industry. Yes, I mean there's just so many so many ways to get your money, and none of none of them are like at the same level. Most of the revenue was created for uh, actual actual physical records and CDs and cassettes and such. And now they're, they're having trouble coming to terms about downloads, about streaming and stuff. And the songwriters get hit the hardest on that. But producers, it just means there's less to do because uh, nobody wants to spend money making a big, cool-sounding record. But it's just too expensive. People are doing the records in their, in their bedrooms on a laptop. And kids are listening to the music on the earbuds. So you don't have to worry about that bottom end that you try to get so good. Uh, that's a good point. I've never thought about the earbuds. Uh, well, and before you were producing records and having your heyday in Music City, you were Elvis Presley's last piano player. Is that right? That's right. You know, I grew up in the church. My dad was an evangelist, and I got my job with Elvis because I worked for a guy named J.D. Sumner, who was Elvis's hero. So eventually I got the job with Elvis and uh, until he passed away. And it's amazing, of all the things I've done that made me money, it was after that. But it seems as though that defines my whole career. <laughs> I, did a, I did an interview with Dave Grohl for Sonic Highways, and after we talked for two hours about Nashville, he said, I hear you hate this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I said, you're going to ask me an Elvis question. He said, I am. I said, go ahead, man. It defines my career anyway. So. Well, it's, it's such a big name. Uh, it's kind of to be expected. But so was that hard for you that I just asked you about Elvis? No, no, not at all. You know, because after that, because I was raised in the church, after Elvis, uh, I got the job with Elvis because his piano player left him to go tour with Emmy Lou Harris. So when Elvis passed away, this piano player, Glenn D. Harden, left Emmy Lou to go tour with John Denver. So I replaced him with Emmy Lou Harris, which is where I met Rodney Crowell and Roseanne Cash and Vince Gill which I ended up playing with them and producing their records. Good so, networking. Yeah, it's like good networking and uh, like sliding doors, you know. And then that led to getting a job eventually. I realized that I needed a real job that had benefits because mus most musicians don't have health care. They don't have a plan B. So I got a job with a record company, and, and I was with RCA for three years and then MCA for 25 years. Uh, real quick, do you want to hear my uh, Elvis impression? It's this thing, it's, wise men said, only fools rush in. It's not bad. More, he said he didn't want to talk about Elvis, and now you're, Thank you very much. Make, yeah, Thank and now you're doing an impression. Um, Tony, it's been, it. uh, it's been a, a very fruitful career for you. And uh, now you say you were raised in the church. Uh, what state are we talking here? Uh, North Carolina, uh, the Bible Belt. So I was raised in the church, and I was only allowed to listen to, to Christian music. So I grew up not even knowing what Elvis did. Uh, Elvis was the devil. Was a celebrity. And so when I got with Elvis, 
I was excited just about being in a gig that was so big. You know, 15-piece horn section, 20 backup singers, uh, nine-piece band, and playing for Elvis. But uh, only after Elvis passed away, then I started playing with Amy Lou Harris. Did I start discovering and studying music? You know, I, Amy Lou sort of turned me on to uh, who Elvis was. She said, "You know who you played for?" I said, "Elvis." She said, "No, I mean, there are all these white guys that were trying to do black people's music, and he was the one that made it. You know, he was so cool." Yeah, that 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 was kind of his. Uh Claim uh, that's what was so amazing about him. I think when he first started out, that he sounded like a black guy. Is that is that right? That's right. You know, and uh, CMT and he has, gyrated. Well, he gyrated. But black guys gyrate, right? right? I mean, he's the guy that everybody wanted to sing like black singers. I mean, even today, I mean, Ariana Grande tries to sing like Whitney Houston. Uh, Brit, you know, it's like everybody wants to. Black people are so free that they know how to let it go. So. They really are. Uh, no one has ever said that we are behaving like black talk show hosts. Uh, we are about as white as it gets, I think, Ben and I are. And, and we're verging on inappropriate talk here, but we're going to push through. I In think. the interviews. Well, well you know, my, <laughs> one mind. of my favorite songs, <laughs> pop songs, was Play That Cajun Music, Black and White Boy. There <laughs> you go. Uh, now, you're, let's, let's get, before we uh, talk any more about race, uh, let's, let's talk about your involvement with the Film Festival, you're hosting a huge party tonight, and I think we're going to put your address up on the screen. We, we have it, I believe show it, that. we have it under... Yeah, so it's open, we don't have the tech, yeah. open door policy here, and the, we're going to get the address at the bottom of the screen. Tell us why people should come out <laughs> to your <laughs> HBO party tonight. Because my ex-wife is using my house as the venue. She lives in the <laughs> same place I live, the same community. So just come and... Tear it up. Yeah, tear it up, man. <laughs> but in in all seriousness, we didn't get invitations to this party, and and you know, I mean, we're we're we're, we're used to slaving it. away. We're used uh, to it. You know, doing these interviews. It, was there uh, some sort of mix up with the mail, or was it an evite thing? What happened? I told my ex wife to invite you guys, so it's not my fault. It's her fault. It's I her see fault. why you left her, Tony. Got a divorce. Yeah, that's it. Over you guys not being invited. So. <laughs> hey, so Sharon, <laughs> I believe is her name. Susan. Susan, get it together. I think we have her address up on the and screen as well. Yeah, we'll go ahead and right show Right there that. now. <laughs> um, uh, now, Tony, are, have you see, are you going to see any of the movies at the film festival, or have you already? I have not. I want to see the uh, songwriter movie because Jim Lauderdale is part of it, and I think I cut a couple of Jim's first big hits with George Strait for the Pure Country soundtrack, and it sort of put him on the map. And uh, so I want to see that because songwriters, to me, you know, songwriters thank me for cutting their songs, and I go, no, thank you for the song, because without the song, I wouldn't have had a record to cut. So I want to see that for sure. Hey, let me ask you Very something. Good. What do you think, you know, you've been uh, lauded as the founder of the Americana country movement, <laughs> but what do you think about uh, Nashville's music town today, how it's sort of branched off? And uh, it's not, I mean, country music's still prominent here, but you can get, you can see and hear so many great genres. Well, you know, it's always been that way, but social media has opened up this town because, you know, we've always had, I mean, the Everly Brothers came out of here, Roy Orbison, uh, just a lot of things. You know, K Kings of Leon have lived here for like five or six years. A lot of great music, pop music has come from Nashville, but now because of social media, I think everybody realizes it's really a songwriter's town which attracts not just country music people, but any kind of people. Songwriters are the nucleus of uh, music, period. And I think that's what has made this town, all of a sudden people go, oh, wow, there's rock and roll there. I mean, Megan Trainer is out of here. Who would have thought? It's just... Go ahead. Well, now it's, you're saying it's a songwriter's town despite the fact that there's a film here uh, about how songwriters are... A dying breed, maybe. Fleeing Nashville? Well, a dying breed only meaning dying because they're, they're not getting paid what they should be paid. You know, they're, so, so I think songwriters have always been behind the scenes to a lot of people. And just in the last five years, I've noticed there's been lots of documentaries, lots of things that bring them out front because uh, some songwriters want to be in the background, but some songwriters really would like, uh, hey, man, you're really good, <laughs> you know, besides the money. They were like a little pat on the back because the guitar player plays a rock solo and the crowd goes wild. 
And then, uh, and then the guy that wrote the song says, I wrote that song. And the person goes, sure you did. Yeah, he goes home alone. That's right, he goes home alone. Yeah. Well, I think we're uh, just about out of time here. But uh, thanks so much for joining us, Tony. And uh, one more time, your ex-wife's address. I'm so sorry. What is Sharon? Well, <laughs> I mean, look, we'll be, you know, the maitre d's at the party tonight if we could just get a yeah, gosh we'll, we'll darn help invite. Out. We, could, uh, we could park cars. Hey, I'm in trouble already, so I'm not going to tell you her name or where, where the party's at. But okay. it is, it's going to be a good party at HBO. So it should be pretty fun. Hey, real quick before we go, I do know your assistant wanted you to mention Jim. Who is Jim? Jim Lauderdale. Oh, Jim. So you already oh, mentioned you him. you mentioned him. Good. Well, good job, Tony. <laughs> you were on it more than we were. See you at the party. See you at the party. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tony.